Thank you. And unfortunately, it is also a um, anniversary, a hundred year anniversary of the Chicago race riots, which went on from the 27th of July until the 8th of August. And in that uh, riot, which was started by a, a teenage Afro-American boy was swimming in the Great Lakes and he drifted over into a white section and a white man threw stones at him. To get away from the stones, he pushed off from a railroad tie that he was hanging on to and drowned. From there, the riots ensued. First, the blacks would try to get the police to do something. They wouldn't do anything. They let the white man go. Uh, the African Americans went in. Uh, there were fights that were initiated by the African Americans. The whites uh, fought back. It moved into the neighborhoods. At this point, you're also having, because of the First World War, the great migration to the north, to all the factories in the north, because of all the drain of men into the military to fight in the war that saved us democracy. And so there was the great migration and there was tensions in housing. So before this all happened, these things just don't come out of anywhere. From uh, July of 1917 till March of 1921, there were 58 bombings of Afro-American houses in Chicago alone. And that was happening all over the North with this great migration. And unfortunately, this outbreak that we're having the anniversary of right now, uh, 23 African-Americans were killed, 15 whites were killed, so that's 38 total. 537 were injured, 178 whites, 342 Afro-Americans. And what really was one of the most damaging things for the Afro-American community is that a hou thousand houses burned. <coughs> so again, an unfortunate 100th anniversary and unfortunately still timely in our time, especially after our the great leader of the Western world spoke down over the past two weeks to the four representatives in the Congress because of their race. And uh, Elijah Cummings was another one that he attacked. And then the civil rights leaders. Welcome to the brave new world. So, shifting gears, uh, what I want to do is give a quick timeline of what's going on in the world and with Scott. And then I want to get to the charges against Scott. And then what I've done is I've gone through, uh, there was a socialist newspaper out of New York. It was an evening paper called The Call. And they sent a reporter there every day to cover this trial. It went on for seven days. And their reporter was excellent. So I've taken out of his reporting some of the, uh, some of the commentary because the tenor of the court is different than what I had thought it was compared to what happened to Eugene Debs or Victor Berger or the IWW uh, people who were prosecuted during this time, Big Bill Hayward. At the same time as this is, Scott's go, uh, this is going on for Scott, you also have the deportation on, of undesirable aliens is really picking up speed at this point. So you're seeing this complex of things happening at the same time. And the, this uh, takes place in February. Uh, what you had was the collapse of the German Republic after the end of the war. And then, uh, actually it wasn't the Republic that went, the Emperor abdicated. The Republic was tried to brought forward. There was the Spartacus movement, which was then put down by what was left of the military. Rosa Luxemburg is killed at the end of January of 1919. So there's a lot going on. During Scott's trial, the Prime Minister of France, Clemenceau, is shot at by an anarchist. Seven bullets, three hit Clemenceau. There's a plot uh, supposedly put forward by the IWW to assassinate Wilson. So there's a lot going on nationally, internationally. And when the election of 1920 comes up, what really sparks people's interest in Warren G. Harding, 
who until our present president was the worst president we've ever had, um, he said, I want to get back to normalcy. And that's what the country was really trying to do. But you had gone through this horrific war, absolutely horrific. And you had this huge shifting of the population, not just the, um, the um, African Americans coming up out of the South to work in all the industrial areas, but also women going into the factories. And when the men came back, you had another battle. You had a social battle going on now. So that gives you an idea of the, the, uh, the friction that was going on. So let's do a real quick timeline here. And this is, it's amazing what's going on here. So in um, 1917 in February is the Russian Revolution. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So the first thing the Russians do is they negotiate a treaty with Germany to stop hostilities which of course, quote, the Allies, including the United States, are not happy about. And because of that, anybody of Russian origin is now under question, just as before the Germans were under question in the United States. And this will come up in the trial when we deal with the jury. Uh, then in April, Wilson addresses Congress, and within three to four days, Congress uh, backs up his declaration of war against Germany. Uh, at this point in April, Scott leaves the first congregational church in the University of, uh, in the Toledo area because his, his um, clergy is now pro-war within one week because we go to war. So that's the end of Scott's going to any organized church. Uh, then you have here in July, Scott joins the, uh, the Socialist Party, and then on June 15th, just before, the es Espionage and Sedition Act is passed. This is what Scott's going to be charged under. So we keep going along, and then what you really have here in September is a big, big situation, because right before he um, joins the Socialist Party, he's fired from the University of Toledo for his anti-war stance. And what happens in June, uh, July and August, Scott is at Chautauqua, which he's done for about a decade speaking. That's the last time he'll go there. He's disinvited as he's been disinvited in all these educational uh, organizations that he's been part of. And at the same time, all of his Macmillan uh, textbooks and books that have been published over, since 1908 are all pulped because they don't want a radical on their list. And at that point, what's Scott's response in September when he moves to New York? He writes The Great Madness, which is going to what, be what causes the United States to come down on him for sedition. And on the 16th of August, on uh, the 16th of September, no, I'm sorry, on the 12th of September of 1917, the federal government raids Scott's Toledo home. So things are moving very quickly in Scott's life. And when this happens, um, his is the first domestic domicile in the United States to be raided. Believe me, there are many more to come. But he gets the honor of being number one. That's how much they wanted him. So the, um, in September, Great Madness comes out. He's been writing it through the summer of 1917. And then in February of 1918, he is indicted for violating the Sedition Act by the United States government. In March, the grand jury returns the indictment. In July, Eugene Debs is found guilty on the same charge under the Sedition Act and gets 20 years. So this is what Scott's looking at under this indictment. Serious time. Uh, we move along here. So in around, during the fall of that year, Judge Learned Hand rejects uh, a request for dismissal. So the case is going to go forward. What does Scott do while he's under indictment that fall? And he's now teaching at the Rand School, and he's in trouble with the federal government. He decides to run against uh, LaGuardia for the 14th Congressional District. Now, obviously he loses, but most people would keep a little lower profile than that. So now we're moving along. November comes along, 11th hour, the 11th month. 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, is the end of the war. And in November also, 
just to keep the headlines boiling, you have the November Revolution in Russia. So there's all sorts of issues going on in there between the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks and the Whites. and the, That's quite a, a story there, too. So in the meantime, while he's under an indictment and Russia's going down, the war ends, and he's running for uh, Congress, he writes a pamphlet on Eugene Debs. So what's the best thing you can do when you're under an indictment for the same thing Debs is under? You write about Eugene Debs. Scott's tenacity and bravery uh, are breathtaking at times. So you get up to 1919, uh, like I said, in January, Rosa Luxemburg is killed. So Europe is in incredible turmoil, even though the war is over. And then from the 5th to the 19th of February, Scott goes on trial. It's in New York City at the old post office building. And as I said, a whole bunch of things. Uh, Clouseau is shot. Um, Underdesirable aliens are removed. So there's just amazing amount of stuff going on. And at the same time, one of the things that happened with the ramping up of the industrial sector in the United States uh, during the war was not only a change of who was doing the work, but also a greater sense of union uh, solidarity. And there was a lot of money being made through war contracts, and the workers weren't getting what they felt was their fair share. Therefore, there were many strikes across the United States. And of course, the government was going to treat them as seditious as anybody else. So that gives you um, a basic idea of what's happening within a 14, 16 month period of Scott's life, world life, and national life. So now let's get to the fun stuff here. It's the United States versus Scott Nearing, has a ring to it, but it's also against the American Socialist Society, which published the pamphlet, The Great Madness, which is part of the Rand School. They own the Rand School. First, uh, first charge, conspiracy by defendants to attempt to cause insubordination, disloyalty, and mutiny in military and naval forces. Two, conspiracy to obstruct the recruiting and enlistment of soldiers and sailors. Three, attempt by defendants to cause insubordination. And this is really in the document. Insubordination, etc. in military and naval forces, etc. That gives your prosecutor a lot of leeway to throw a lot of junk into the case to try and bring you down. Four, obstruction by the defendants of the recruiting and enlistment service of the United States. So these are the big three. Uh, two charges on conspiracy for both parties, and also this insubordination charge and obstruction charge. The instruction, obstruction charge is going to be one they finally settle on, and I'll tell you about that as we go through. So. When you have something like this going on, you're not alone. There's a lot of people in the courtroom. But these are the main characters. So you have Judge Julius M. Mayer, who has been on the bench for decades in New York City, is well thought of, um, and is actually very open-handed in the courtroom towards defendants. Uh, some of the stuff that I was reading in Scott's FBI file, you see exchanges uh, between him and Washington, D.C. And he's very sure, uh, very certain of himself that he wants people to have their full say in court. So Scott really, I feel, got about the best judge he was going to get in New York City at this time period. The attorneys uh, for the government, uh, this is the assistant U.S. district attorney, Earl Barnes. And Scott has four individuals who are his defense team. Seymour Stedman, who's from Chicago, and we'll talk about him in a minute. S. John Block, Walter Nels, and I. M. Sacken. Uh, Stedman was the one who really did the courtroom talking, cross-examination, and questioning. The others were there really on um, points of law and finer details within the case, and would talk to Scott and to Stedman about what their next procedure would be. Now we come to the jurors. Irving Zimmer, 55 years old, salesman of malt extract, owns some bonds. As we go through this, what I found really interesting in the questioning of the jury 
is that they wanted to make sure that nobody on the jury had any knowledge of socialism. If you had any knowledge of socialism, you were off. Especially if you were for it. But all the capitalists, oh, they're fine, come on in. You probably hate socialism, which is what we want on our jury. Stanley Ketchum, he's 50 years old, connected to Lackawanna, uh, Wyoming Transit Corporation, the Carolina Construction Company, the Union, Union Metallurgical Company, and the Carolina and Tennessee Power Company. Just your everyday Joe from New York City. Then you have Gustav Gumpsertz, I'm probably saying that wrong. He's over 50, but he's born in Germany, retired clothing manufacturer who has a son in the army, which of course isn't going to uh, warp his opinion about this case. Joseph Hecht, he's 38 years old, he's born in Austria, a steel contractor with a national and iron steel company. Uh, company has war contracts. Again, an impartial juror. Samuel Welser, 60 years old, retired contractor from electrical and medical work, owns some stock and active in the Red Cross. Uh, William Eblor, I'm sorry about that, 60-year-old, born in Germany, retired grocer, son who works at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Again, he won't be swayed one way or the other, obviously. Sam Gordon, 55 years old, born in Russia, reporter and exporter of merchandise. Interesting. Alfred Trotter, 63 years old, president of a building company and veteran of the 7th Regiment. At least they got rid of the people who would be really problematic on the court. Solomon Marcus, 65 years, retired merchant, born in Russia, in U.S. since 1868. So he's seen the entire arc of industrialism, the Gilded Age, and the Age of the Plutocrats, which is what Scott's going to talk about. Albert Walburn, 60 years old, retired, um, retired treasurer of a foundry and machine shop, acted as a draft board registrar in Pennsylvania. Again, another impartial juror. Isaac Anhalt, 50 years old, born in Germany, a diamond broker, pro-conscription. That was the other thing. You had to be, all these guys are pro-war and pro-conscription, -cons -cons and only one of them would have been under conscription if the war had gone on longer. And finally, uh, P.R. de Brakey, 38 years old, born in Paris, secretary of a chemical corporation and stockholder in the same company. Yes, he did. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I, um, no, they wanted, the government really wanted them to go to jury trials. Because mm -hmm. they wanted to, uh, what's interesting, um, in some ways, just like the war effort, it took time for them to figure out how to be actually part of the war effort. In some ways, the government didn't know how to prosecute who they wanted to prosecute. So when they put Debs and these people on, um, on the stands, they got orators. And it, it made them really nervous because they thought they could talk themselves out of the case. Uh, in Debs' um, case, it, it didn't work. And I think it was a lot to do with uh, Debs' personality and the way he came across. And I want to talk about that a little bit compared to Scott. And so by the time they get to Scott, when you're reading the documents from, um, from the Justice Department, they're really concerned that Scott is a, a proselytizer and he's looking for the limelight, and he wants a chance to talk, and he wants to get his point across, and they're really worried about him going up there, because they, they see what he can do. And he, they're worried that he's going to get off by talking himself off. And the way you do that is, you get out... <laughs> well, the way you do it is dodge questions, which Scott resolutely refused to do. So let's go into uh, how the court case unfolded. Now, one other thing before we start, and this kind of ties into what you were talking about. There was an interesting piece of uh, literature that I found from the Liberty Defense Union. And what they evolved was they were looking at how the government was prosecuting these cases. So uh, one of the first cases, and what they're calling it is the stretch of the statute. If we get a conviction here, let's go for the next one, but how can we make that statute a little bit bigger to get more people in so we can shut them down? 
So the first one off is Fred Kraft, who is a socialist nominee for the New Jersey governor. And he is convicted for making a public speech at which soldiers are present, where he questions whether we should be going to war. For making a public speech. That's seditious. So then the next case that comes up is the Masses case. And the Masses was a, 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 a socialist leftist uh, magazine. Scott wrote for it and was friends with Max Eastman. Uh, and the sedition here was by indirect means, i.e. through writings, cartoons, and publications. And in this case, what they did was they had two um, soldiers come on as witnesses for the prosecution saying, we know a third guy who read the masses and then refused to go into active combat. So you're using secondary witnesses, not primary witnesses. And they got away with it. They got the conviction. So now they're going to step it up one more level with Scott Nearing. And the idea here is that any radical thought and expression thereof is by its very nature seditious. Period. Any open discussion is seditious if it is not government line. That's what they're going for. And in Scott's case, no witnesses. They're charging him with conspiracy and obstruction, and they have no witnesses. And they're not look, they don't look for witnesses. And if they did, they couldn't find any. So this is the idea of the natural, they call it the natural consequences theory. If you know this is going against the government line, therefore you're guilty of being seditious. That's the natural consequence. You should have known that by saying that people should question whether we should be going to the war is seditious, therefore you're guilty, period. So you can see how they're trying to escalate the, uh, the, the breadth, uh, reach, and scope of this. But one of the things that was working in Scott's favor at this point is the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, the end of the war. And there's a decompression within the populace. Now, you're starting to get anarchist activity, and that's roiling around in there. But right now, people do want to get back to the normal. So there's a different tenor than in the Debs trial, which was in full, 100%, and they called it 100% Americanism, which is what Wilson promoted. And so by the time Scott comes along, there's a bit of decompression from there. And it, uh, even in Barnes, who's the prosecutor, says at the beginning of the trial, it is not necessary for the government to show that there was any actual obstruction in a sense of a physical obstruction. It is not necessary for the government to show actual uh, mutiny or disloyalty. But publication of the, this book itself is efficient to result in a conviction. Just publishing, period. Just saying it, period. You're seditious. Uh, and Scott's closing argument, he and Stedman both talk about the idea of intent. But that's a little ways down the road. So what you have here with the jury and, uh, is what you would consider fairly stacked. But both of the, um, the lawyers had chances and there were cuts made on both sides. Some were one-sided, either side didn't want them, or... Um, there were two or three cases where both sides agreed that that juror would be let go. Uh, they had a pool of 30, and they came up with 12. It took two days. The first day of the, um, the trial, Stedman was coming back from Chicago because he had just finished another sedition trial in Chicago, so he hadn't gotten there yet. So they started the jury process, shut down for the day. So the 6th of February is really your first day. So... What I thought was interesting in the uh, reportage on this is I want to give you a sense of what the tenor of the court was, the atmosphere. Before the judge appeared in court, while prospective jurymen who had been summoned talked in undertones, the lawyers, reporters, witnesses, and court attendees crowded inside the council rail, nearing leaned against the council table in conversation with District Attorney Barnes and his own lawyers, Block and Nels. Uh, so it's interesting, right there, there's this almost camaraderie. Remember where Scott comes out of? He, he doesn't come out of the working class. He comes out of uh, 
the owning class. His grandfather ran Morris Run as a coal town. He was known as the Czar. S uh, Scott's family moves to, New York, uh, to Penn, uh, Philadelphia so that he can go to a proper high school, then ends up at the University of Pennsylvania and gets a doctorate in economics. And one of the first things, questions on the stand to him is, what does your father do? And Scott just smiles and says, my dad's a stockbroker. <laughs> so what you're seeing here, there's not a class divide between these people on the jury and Scott. And I think there's a difference there where Debs came out of a different world. He came up through the ranks of the working class. Um, let's see. Here's another thing. The accused professor, briefcase in hand, made his way to the side of his lawyers before the judge. Throughout the trial, what they talk about Scott doing is he's taking notes throughout the trial. He's passing notes to his lawyer. He has a briefcase. When he goes on the stand, he takes the briefcase with him. When he's, address, he's about to address the jury for the two days of examination by both sides, um, they give the entire jury not only the great madness, but all of his textbooks that have just been pulped. Every individual gets that. So, I mean, these people are walking out with a stack. It's like 12 books plus the pamphlet. Light reading for when you're being sequestered. Um, let's see here. I've got more detail than you guys need. So uh, there was, five, as I said, five were excused by the defense, two by the prosecution, four by consent, and then they were able to move forward. There was a ripple of mirth throughout the courtroom as one prospective juror after another was asked if he read the call, which is the, the socialist magazine. When Fred Islington, a uh, architectural sculptor, said he read the call occasionally, Judge Mayer remarked with a smile, the circulation manager is looking up. The whole day was characterized by the utmost good humor in which the judge, the U.S. District Attorney, defendants, witnesses, jurors, and court attendants shared. I was really surprised to find this. And I had been also reading the New York Tribune. And they're incredibly caustic towards Scott. So they're concentrating on him as a person and his beliefs. And this is a socialist uh, magazine, and they don't... I just find it interesting that they're very positive about the atmosphere in the court. And I feel it's a, a, a truer to the tenor. The Tribune felt as though they were really trying to keep the war hatred up. And this is like reporting what's actually going on. Oh, a reporter reporting. That's radical, probably seditious. Um, oh, and a good example of what's going on here, instead of it's from Chicago, so there's a difference. Uh, I just started off with Chicago, didn't I? Tough town at this point. I don't know, the shoulders of well, um, Sandburg is the shoulders of the world. It was the butcher capital of the world, the stockyard of the, uh, of the world. <laughs> All that meat went through Chicago and went to the First World War. And then when it didn't, wasn't used, they sent it back <laughs> and they sold it here. And just a little detail. A burst of laughter followed the m remark of the judge when a juror failed to understand the Western term which Stedman introduced in his examination. Stedman had asked him if he did not uh, recognize the fact that a man opposed to the prohibition uh, law was an altogether different class from a man who kept a blind peg. The judge said, I fear the juror does not understand you. The term blind pig is not judicially known. Stedman replied, I was born in the East, but I have acquired Western terms. Blind pig is recognized judicial language in Chicago. He then kept the laughter going by explaining that a blind pig is a place where a man lays a quarter on a shelf from below which a drink of whiskey mysteriously rises. So if you go away with nothing else tonight, you now have a piece of American slang that you might not have been aware of. But I just find it very interesting that the the judge didn't shut this down. That there's this almost camaraderie in it. While you're still dealing with really sedition and um, an obstruction of recruiting and insubordination. I mean, these are heavy duty things. So 
what I wanted to do then is just let's get right to uh, there's all this information that you don't need so we're gonna get to uh, day three there's first thing they do the government does is they bring on a group of people who worked for the Rand school the publication manager the editor the guy who ran the bookstore and they ran them through all this information about how was it published why did you choose this manuscript how much was all the technical questions so they're trying to do this distribution and one thing that comes up in that questioning is oh by the way we were sending it through the mails and the US Postal Service didn't shut us down so if it was seditious how come you were sending it through the mails because they were shutting everybody down that was one of the first things they did when uh, the Sedition Act came in. They got into the post office, set up a propaganda, well, I call it propaganda, a, uh, what would you call it? A, uh, <laughs> not an editorial board. Censorship. Censorship board, that's the word I was grasping for. And they shut masses, that's how they got the masses. The shut them down was through the Postal Service. So, they go on like this. And what I found very interesting is the last time I talked with you folks, I had said that Scott read the entire pamphlet out loud to the jury. He didn't. But the entire pamphlet was read out loud. Two hours it took. And it was read by the prosecuting attorney Barnes, which I think was really interesting. And one, the guy who's writing this, the reporter says, the man who had written the words bent his head forward with the others over the paragraphs he had written in his quiet study were echoed in the judicial hall to which he had been summoned to answer for the writing. So literally, Scott, like a good student, is following along his own text. I find it really fascinating how this unfolds. I don't know if you do. Finally, on day four, so we're I mean, this is taking a lot of time and energy by both sides. So finally, Scott's on the stand on day four after you have this, uh, these individuals in the morning. Scott goes on in the afternoon, and he's on from about one till five. So four hours of, uh, of this going on. And so they go through various things about clarifying. And what Scott, uh, what the, the, they're really trying to do uh, from the prosecution side is they're trying to nail him down around issues such as the Liberty Bond. Why are you against the Liberty Bond? Why are you against conscription? Why are you against the war? And Scott's basic argument is that the reason we got into the war was because the plutocrats, those who own the financial industry and the industrial sector, had placed their bets on the Allies and had put a lot of money and hardware into the war before we were in and they were about to lose their shirts because of how well Germany was doing and so that the plutocrat class started whipping up and through the newspapers which most of them they controlled the Tribune the, the Wall Street Journal all these things and that through that propaganda they got the uh, US ready for war Wilson is um, reelected on keeping us out of the war in 1916 and he's sworn in March 4th used to be the time when they swore him in before that date in 1918 he's um, he's declared war 1917 he's declared war so quick turnaround he hasn't even gotten his second administration going yet and we're going into war so that's what they're really looking for. And that's what they're going to base all this conspiracy between the two parties, Scott and the American Socialist Society, the conspiracy that you both know what you were doing. What are we talking about? Intent. What was your intent in the publication? And the intent the government wanted to prove was that you were obstructing uh, people going in for the draft and causing insubordination and et cetera among the military without any witnesses. And the, in the FBI files from the Justice Department, they say, we got a problem here, we got no witnesses. All we're basing our case on is the content of Scott's writings. And the word comes back, it's like, yep, that's what you got, go for it. 
but they had that idea of the development of natural consequences that they were going to push the case anyway. So, the cult, um, so Scott goes up there. Now, the pamphlet's been read all the way through by the prosecuting uh, attorney. And now Scott goes through and he starts reading certain sections. He says, this is what I think about the Liberty Bond. Basically, the Liberty Bond is about the militarists or the plutocratic class wanted to get into war and then they started to have to spend money on it. Well, that's a losing proposition. You're cutting into your profit margin. So what they wanted to do was put that financial burden on the populace. So they developed the Liberty Bond. And oh, by the way, if you don't buy your quota of Liberty Bonds, you don't have a job. Bye. And every other employer is doing the same thing. So what are you going to do? If, even if you can't afford it, you're going to buy Liberty Bonds. And that's what Scott was against. People being forced against their will with a gun against their livelihood head. He says, what do you think they're going to do? And I see it and I am going to call it out. Is that obstructing? So, Greg, you're saying that employees and factories were basically forced by their employers to buy the bonds? Well, what, you, you're coming out of the factory gate, right? And right at the uh, factory gate is the Liberty Bond guy. And every, people are stopping. Oh, by that, your floor manager is standing there, seeing who does and doesn't. And what's really interesting in this case, when he's asked, when Scott's asked, well, can you, uh, by the prosecutor, can you give me examples? Well, I heard about a man in Chicago. I heard about a man in Toledo. I heard about this. Well, you can name, will you name the name? Does that sound familiar from our experience with McCarthy? Scott refuses to name names. He refuses. And, and in some ways, it's a tit for a tat, right? Okay, you don't have any witnesses against me. I'm not going to give you these people to get run under your legal roller. So he's very principled about that. He was... I am on trial, nobody else, I will speak for myself, and I'm not naming names. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a real big problem. And the propaganda machine that Creel set up through the U.S. government was backing all this up. And on top of that, when we went to the war, you had all the uh, people of industry, uh, the Oppenheimers and the Rockefellers and all these guys became $1 a day men. Uh, this isn't that good out of their hearts. They're going to work for the government for one hour today to run your uh, naval yard supply company. Well, by the way, we're cutting ourselves in on the contracts. Or my son, or my nephew, or my son-in-law. No collusion there, right? Another echo? So, Scott is a very tenacious witness, as is, are the questioners. And there's a certain point where uh, he's being questioned by the prosecution, and he starts, he answers, and then another question, and he answers, and, and finally his Stedman objects and says, Your Honor, <laughs> my client is doing such an, he's doing football rushes. I can't get a word in edgewise to make my legal ob uh, objection. And Barnes turns to Scott and just looks at him and says, You'd like to answer the question, wouldn't you? And Scott goes, Yeah, I'd like to answer the question. So Scott's going against his counsel at, at certain points because he, I think, really felt that this was it. There was a high probability that he was going to jail for 10 to 20 years. But he felt that this was his last opportunity as a, he lost his job at the University of Pennsylvania in 1915. Uh, he lost his job at the University of Pennsylvania in 1917. The Rand School, how much longer is that going to be around? His academic career is over. They've shredded all of his textbooks, which was another form of income. He is getting published by some newspapers. I saw, found some. Oh, yeah, while he's on trial, what do you do? Oh, you write um, uh, articles for newspapers, radical newspapers, talking about the plutocrats, talking about the liberty bonds. So even while he's in an indictment, even while he's on trial, he's still writing this stuff and having it published where he can. But at the trial, when, I, I'm sensing that certainly a big part of Scott is going to always lean back and rely on the fact that he's an academic. So as you go forward, he's going to present an academic argument. Yep. And that kind of comes 
head to head with the legal argument. Yes. His lawyers are really good at. Right. And he, but he's going, he's going to stick to that. I mean, he's a, he's a confirmed, dedicated academic. Uh, academic. To talk about that. And good. also a debater. I mean, he is a professional debater. One of the most brilliant things that Scott does is, he says, you think this is a radical position, um, that uh, economic interests, na in national economic interests causes war. Well, let me quote to you from the uh, Naval League's <laughs> publication, Sea Power. And that's what they're saying. They're saying the same thing. He says, oh, well, then let me quote the New York Times. Let me quote the Wall Street Journal. So Scott doesn't defend his position by saying, oh, Deb said this. He's like, no. He goes to the financial papers. He quotes Lord Palmerston, who said, the flag follows the dollar. He was absolutely, he stayed, and it was absolutely a brilliant. It's, if you think I'm radical, these are the people that are on your side. Uh, Professor Schlegelman from Columbia a real conservative person who was saying the same thing about war. And he says, your side is saying this. And it's interesting when you look at it, there were a lot of isolationist Republicans who didn't want to go into the war. None of them were charged with sedition. They had spoken against the war. He even quotes senators who, while the trial is going on, are speaking against the war and the Sedition Act. They don't get in trouble. So it's really a, uh, an incredibly adroit move. And even if you look at something like living the good life, if you go through the bibliography, there are conservative, there's a book in there by Weaver called Ideas Have Consequences. Conservative side of the spectrum from Scott. But Scott always read across the entire spectrum. Conservative to radical. And then he was able to piece it together and say, all right, you're all not on the same page as to where we want to get to and how to get there, but you're diagnosing it in the same way. So I think that was, uh, it's, I find it brilliant. And uh, if you, anybody can find it, you probably can find it online. The Rand School published the Trials of American Socialist Society, and this is an uh, extract of the testimony. So it's word for word, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And you can see that back and forth. And you can see Scott developing his argumentation as the prosecutor is trying to get in there. What I also found interesting was, and I know this, that the, the, at certain points there would be actually question and answers between Scott and the judge. There's a whole long series of questions between, well, how do you define a, plut uh, a plutocratic, plutocratic individual? Is it this income? Is it this? Is it this? So they go through all that. But also, jurors were able to ask questions, which I found, I'd never heard of that before. Literally, uh, uh, can you, uh, Trotter, I remember Trotter in particular asked several questions to be explained. So they go along, and as I said, he's quoting from Sea Power, which is a Navy League, uh, it's uh, publication. And here's what the Navy, remember all the stuff that Scott's talking about. And in 1916, the Navy League publishes its creed. And Scott must have loved this because it's one, two, three, four, five. You know, he loved that stuff. So, number one, that most modern wars arise largely from commercial rivalries. Oh, and these guys are conservative. Two, that we are now seizing the world's trade, the United States. And we were, because Europe had been pulled apart, and so we were providing the food and the ammunition, and then finally the bodies to fight the war. Three, that following the present war will come the most drastic readjustment and the most dangerous rivalries ever known. Scott's saying the same thing throughout the 20s and into the 30s. He says, the First World War is only the prelude to and the cause of the second. Same thing here. Four, that the U.S. will be the storm center of the disturbance. And five, and that consequently, consequently it is our duty to guard ourselves against these dangers while there is yet time. Right? So that's preparedness. That's having a full-time standing army even in peacetime. 
That's going out and making... That's the Navy League creed. Scott could have signed that. Absolutely could have signed that. And that was his point. It's like, how radical am I when your guys are saying it? Why am I on trial for sedition? Oh, because I had intent to cause muse mutiny. That's what they were going for. The intent. So, let's see where we are. Um, so, uh, day five, he uh, goes through all this uh, cross-examination. And finally, what we get to now are the summation. And Barnes goes up there and makes the same argumentation. That we didn't have to have witnesses. It's intent that's important. Scott should have known by natural consequence that questioning the liberty bonds, questioning the preparedness movement, questioning going to war, questioning uh, the plutocratic control of the government through their financing, he should have known that that was going to cause mutiny and obstruct the draft. That's the argumentation. So Scott gets up there. And Stedman does the basic legal uh, presentation of knocking down the government's argumentation. And this is, I've broken this down because it's 10 pages long. But this is Scott's argumentation. I took on this great public question and a certain position. I presented my views in this book and I can induct and I was inducted for writing the book because the prosecution alleges it caused, it was an obstruction or that it caused, or it was an attempt to cause disloyalty and mutiny. Therefore, I am convicted under the indictment. If I am convicted under the indictment, I will be convicted for an expression of my opinions. There are no other evidence before you except my opinions. He even went to the case he had uh, friends or professional acquaintances who when conscription came up or they were thinking about whether they should sign up for the war, they came to Scott and asked him. He says, well, this is why I think the war is being fought. So this is what you are going to be fighting for. What you do is your decision. And he's very clear throughout the entire thing. And Barnes asks him, well, wasn't your intention that they would agree with you? He says, yes, I would like them to agree with me, but that is their decision. I wanted them to have all the information that they could have to make their decision. I did not make their decision for them, and I did not advise them. So he was very strict in how he dealt with these things. And I can believe this in Scott just because I've read so much of him. So he's moving along here. And he doesn't back down on his position. When Sherman said that war was hell, I believe he meant, or at least to me that means, that war creates a hell inside a man who goes to war. He's going to work himself up into a passion of hatred against somebody else. And that is hell. The destruction of life and property is incidental. The destructive forces that puts, uh, that puts into a man's soul, that's fundamental. So it's your internal hell Scott's talking about here. That's what war does. It just doesn't rip up property. It rips up the soul of the individual. And when you rip up the soul of the individual, you rip up the fabric of society. And Scott was anti-war, period for this reason. Um, I care not for the property of this country if we are going to have gag laws. I care not for the wealth of this country if we are going to be forbidden to have free speech and an opportunity of expressing our minds and expressing our opinions and discussing the great issues that are before us. What happens to one of us is incidental to the great question of what happens to all of us. I have done what I could, and for the time being, the matter is in your hands. So the jury goes out after being charged uh, by the judge. And about day four, the judge X's out the top two conspiracy charges. 
And he says to the prosecution, you have nothing. If you had presented a case, you could, I would let the charges stand. So the first two of conspiracy are out. So now all we have is the attempt to cause insubordination and the obstruction charges. The judge, in his instructions, basically says, I could see where there could be a case for number three, but it's not strong. He puts all of his monies in the instructions on the obstruction of the defendants for recruiting. That's where he lays his uh, attention. The jury goes out. It goes out and it is, I think they're charged at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They come back at 6.30 and they have a question. Question's answered. They go back in at 7.30. Although the judge says, you know, it's been a long day. Let's all have some dinner. So the jury's re, uh, sequestered at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, 12.30. Finally, the word comes back at 1 a.m. They can't come to a decision. So they're let off. They're sequestered at the Knickerbocker Hotel. <laughs> it's the beautiful thing about FBI files. We have the bill from the Knickerbocker plus the bill for transportation. I think it was like $46 or something. Mustn't have been a high-end establishment. So um, they come back the next day at 11, and they're out, and they're out, and they're out. And they come back in, they have more questions for the judge, and finally they say, we're basically at a deadlock. Judge sends them back in, they come back out, and they says, okay, judge, can we split the charge? And we split the charge, charges, and we decide on Scott and the American Socialist Society. He says, well, yes, that's both individuals were charged with these things. So, yes, you can do that. They go back in with an hour, they're back out. Scott is found not guilty. The American Socialist Society is found guilty for obstruction. And um, I believe in the end the fine was $3,000. Thank you again to the FBI file. What we find out is that, let's go back to our group here. They were out 30 hours. And all that time, the courts, yeah. the defendants, and the prosecution are all there waiting for this decision. And again, the good humored nature of this gathering is really amazing to me. There's nobody in the jury box, so Stedman gets up and gets in the jury box and, and, and is lounging in there. Scott's standing there at the rail, and Barnes is standing there at the rail, and they're having a conversation. Incredibly collegial atmosphere. I can't think of another case where a defendant would be hanging out with the prosecutor before the verdict came in. Well, they had 30 hours to kill. At this point, um, the other thing that the judge has done is he's shut the doors. Courtroom's full, has been for the whole court. Hallways are full. So he shuts the doors so there's no traffic. Um, during one of the uh, points where the judge was writing something out, and there's quiet in the court, a newsboy came in. He had just been hired, and he's told his job depended on how fast he got information. So he ran into the court, ran through the rail, ran up to the judge's bench, and was about to take what the judge was writing. And the clerk caught him and said, what are you doing? He says, well, I need that copy fast. I'm going to lose my job. Just a very different atmosphere throughout the entire um, trial. So they come back, and J Scott is miraculously not guilty. And it turns out through interviews with the, um, the jurors that two held out through that whole time. And the people who were really for conviction were the two Germans, the two naturalized German citizens. Because this is 100% Americanism. And Germans, as an ethnic group, went through hell during the First World War. And something I'd like to tie that into is the Chicago race riots. Nowadays, we call, rightly so, the race issues between African Americans and whites. Rightly so. Back during this period, race also included 
the undesirable ethnics, the Poles, the Swedes, the Germans, the Italians, everybody who was an Anglo-Saxon was an undesirable race. So consider that in the mix of what's going on here. And the two that are uh, hold out and actually finally get the foreman, Zimmer, to try and make this uh, split the decision was, they said, we'll go with not convicting Scott if you go for convicting American Socialist Society. And so that was the decision. But it was only because of these two naturalized Russian individuals that Scott got away with it. And if you look at the czarist history of Russia, you might understand why they did that. Because that's what their governments had been doing for years with their judiciary was taking down people like Scott for saying what they said, and they weren't going to have it. So really, Sam Gordon, Solomon Marcus should have a gold star here, because that's what kept Scott out of jail. Do you think the prosecutors were like, unaware of Russian, recent Russian history? Okay, so I was just brought, bringing up uh, the issue around uh, the ethnic racism. In the uh, summing up on February 20th by the uh, district attorney, they basically said it is very difficult to get a jury that is to the government's liking, basically, in these cosmopolitan areas, right? So in the conservative world today, cosmopolitan has been translated to, um, what's the word? diverse, right? That's the dog whistle now. So basically they were saying that you can't trust foreigners, especially these ethnic foreigners. So, um, but when you look at what they were doing, the way they were trying to build this idea of natural consequence, again, at least we had two thinking individuals in the jurors. And that, and then 1919 continues to explode. 1920, we have the election, and Wilson's had his stroke. So for the past multiple months, basically his wife has been running the country because he was so incapacitated by the stroke. So we have had a female president, maybe not by being sworn in, but by actual daily running of the presidency, of the executive branch, and then we elect the man for normalcy, Warren G. Harding. This is a book by uh, Leighton McCarthy, The Teapot Dome Scandal. You want to read about the same crap that's going on now? Cronies in uh, every walk of the government pulling down contracts for all their under cronies, siphoning money off. It's a great book. If you want to understand what happened between 1912 and the war and understand the cultural divide and wrenching nature of it, this is a book by Jeremy uh, McCarter, Young Radicals in the War for American Ideals. Really excellent book. Gives you a quick, thorough overview. Then in the 20s, uh, 1920, we start having the bombings and the anarchists, and we have the Palmer raids and the Red Scares. And we have more deportations of undesirable aliens. Uh, and then we have the day Wall Street, Street exploded, when Wall Street was bombed in 1920. And this is a book by Beverly Gage, really in depth, tells you what was going on socially and also why they were bombing Wall Street. Street. And what this, this is, at the end of every book, Scott had bibliography. This, this is my bibliography. And there's one more in here. Nope, you're good. <laughs> yes, David. <laughs> so that's, that's basically the story. Uh, he goes on, he continues. It. This is what I love. Right during the trial, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of February, uh, it is advertised in the, uh, in the call that on February 28th, Scott will start teaching a course on dynamic socialism. And even through the, this whole period, he's still teaching a current histories or current events class at the Rand School. 
and he's going out and giving speeches and he's part of the people's council so even through all this he is talking and the man had bravery and he stuck to it and he argued his case well so he was bailed out of bail who he, God, he was bailed out nope he was just indicted he was never fully arrested oh he was never arrested yeah oh, he was just okay. indicted okay and then uh, so and any th there were times when Scott was arrested especially out in the west and Scott's number one rule was when you get arrested, get out and post bail as quickly as possible and get out of town. Because the police were nothing to spend your night with, as they in a lot of cases aren't today. Uh, but even more so because there's no, there was no surveillance in the jails. Uh, and in a lot of cases, Scott just uh, wouldn't show up at certain places, uh, certain speeches, because the uh, police commissioner would say, uh, yeah, you can speak here, and if you do, I'm not going to control the crowd. And so they say in other places where Scott, they'll have a socialist meeting, and it says it looks like a reunion of the VFW, because people would come specifically dressed in their military khakis, just discharged, ready for a fight. So it was a very incredibly volatile time to be around, and Scott was very brave, but he wasn't stupid. Yes. Uh, the, the years just preceding all that in, in, in the 20s, what uh, on the uh, kind of the federal level of freedom of speech, how, how the Supreme Court defended it or didn't defend it, or did you, in your research did you okay, kind of dovetail over, over a period of a couple of decades? I'm not sure if it's quite right, but I believe the Debs case and the Victor Berger case go to the Supreme Court. And it is Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the great liberal justice, who basically says in time of war, speech cannot, of this cannot, cannot be tolerated. So that's how this, so really if Scott got convicted here, there was nowhere to go. There, were, there was already precedents in the Supreme Court that we're going to let what happens in the lower courts stay. Period. So how does that evolve in, in the coming decades? Well, you know, uh, what it really had to do was you had to change. Um, it was very slow. And one of the things that FD, um, not FDR, yeah, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did when he came in. He was so frustrated with the conservative slant of the uh, Supreme Court that he tried to get through a uh, change in the Constitution to put more justices on the court. So that because these guys were just staying for decades and they were troglodytes and he was just so frustrated he, he wanted to try and pack the court from the other side. It didn't work but there's been other times. I mean there's talk of it now because of what's happened to the Supreme Court. Now, I've heard in democratic circles if we get the White House we should move towards trying to add more justices because we're stuck with these guys for 50 years. Ruth Bader Ginsburg just came out against that oh and and well she she would I doesn't surprise me in the yeah, least yeah. because it would be an you know it would be two branches of government ganging up on a third but boy if there's a branch that needs to be ganged up on it's the Supreme Court in my remember in my in my opinion and if my opinion is has an intention of sedition and that I believe the law is still on the books you know, some oldie but goodie. And I think it's actually be reignited a few times, especially during uh, Bush II's reign, when we went to Iraq. Well, we went to Afghanistan, but that was a faint because we were going to Iraq in the big time to make up for daddy's mistakes. Um, but there was talk at that point to do the same thing, to use the Sedition Act to try and quelch any type of conversation around this. So these things keep roiling up and roiling up. And that's how Scott was caught up in it and got out of a really dark abyss. Now what happened to Eugene Debs? He was convicted. He had a 20-year sentence at Leavenworth. At this point, he was in his late 50s or early 60s, if I remember right. And uh, it broke him physically, I think, 1922. 
he was pardoned by Warren G. Harding. Probably the only thing Harding did that was of any worth. Other than, sorry, dying in Alaska. <laughs> but then we got Calvin Coolidge. I mean, that's the problem. If we, we get rid of T4, if T45 passes, we end up with Mike Pence, the puppet master. I was like, oh, geez. Okay, that's not such a good plan. So that's where we stand. But then FDR came and he stayed for what? Four terms. Well, 3.25. 3 right. But it was definite change. But the only thing that caused that change was the Great Depression, which is something we really don't want to go through. When Scott talks about a transition from a capitalist society to a more socialistic society, his tenant number one is when you make a transition from one form of social construct to another, number one, you do not lose the industrial, technical uh, standard that you have from the previous social structure. Because if you do, you will revert back to a lower form of a societal stance and you'll end up in the wrong cycle again. So it's really important, and I was really surprised when I looked at it, but it makes a lot of sense. Because um, if you look at it, if you lose technical ability, then what you fall back on is labor, and when you do that, you fall closer back to slavery. Because the modus power that built this country was physical. And a lot of that physical activity, what, who built Washington, D.C.? Slaves. So, uh, <laughs> who clothed us? Slaves. So if you lose your technical capacity within a society, then you are going to revert to that because it becomes, quote, an economic success, uh, necessity. Notice how it all comes back down to the economics of the situation. And that's why it was really important for Scott that these, this parasitic group of people who lived by dividends on stocks and holdings and uh, what boards they might be on and salaries that they pull down, that they're not productive, that they're parasitic. And only by taking that out of the equation could you achieve a, a new society that was more equitable towards the people. Because when your workers are under wagery, the next stage of slavery, what you're doing is out of the worker, you're getting, you're getting more from them than what you pay them. That's how you make profit. You have to get more out of them than you pay them, which means they don't get what they actually produce. They don't get the recompense of it. And if they don't like it, you fire them. That's why you break unions. Oh, well, thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Wait for the movie. <laughs> it make, make a hell of a movie. It's, I, again, the whole tenor of the courtroom was really amazing to me. Yes? Uh, do you have any sense about the effect of this court? What did he do in the immediate aftermath? Oh, he, went right back, he went right back to teaching. He went right back to speaking. He went right back to what he had not stopped doing since he had been indicted. He kept on doing it. And he kept doing more of it. It's interesting. In July of uh, this year of 18, 1919, the Rand School is in um, the Lusk Committee is uh, brought together by the U U uh, New York State Legislature. Le legislature and they're looking into radical activity and the one of the first places that they raid is the Rand School and one of the places to say ransack while they're raiding the Rand School is Scott's office so uh, it just he's under this tremendous pressure all the time then you have the nascent FBI coming up so he's under federal and uh, scrutiny all the time he, he never I don't believe he ever came off of um, the FBI's watch file I, there's in the FBI file, it's like he's 91. And they're saying uh, he's really not active or really that effective anymore as a radical. Word comes back, nope, he stays on. So he has another 50 years of surveillance. And that's a whole other story that I can tell. But on another day. So yeah, he went right back to being Scott Nearing and actually became more radicalized by the garbage that came down out of the Harding administration and the corruption. It just made him even more radicalized because it got more and more intense. And then you have the Roaring Twenties where the disparity becomes even worse between the haves and have-nots.
So it just kept on radicalizing him. But this was a real event for him that I think broke him over to stay true to himself and his beliefs, or I should say opinions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. Yeah,